Good morning, good morning, welcome, welcome again for another great episode in our Acts study. Okay, so picking up where we left off, kind of got into the Spirit, uh, talking a little bit about the Holy Spirit. I think we got a good handle on uh, who He is. And now we're going to head into these, uh, the uh, the incident that happened after the Spirit came upon Peter and the other apostles. I'm also going to take another side trip on one, one last thing, a, a term that's called the last days. A very misunderstood term, I think. Uh, so that uh, during this particular part of the lesson, we're going, to take a, we're going to define that a little bit too. So I said, Spirit-filled Peter speaks with authority. So... Uh, after, after the incident with the Holy Spirit came upon them, everybody thought that they were drunk or that they had uh, had a little bit too much wine with breakfast, I guess, because it was only 9 o'clock in the morning. So Peter speaks uh, with authority about, about that. And he talks about a uh, prophecy from Joel that is happening in this particular uh, incident when, uh, when the Holy Spirit came upon them. So that's the gist of what we're talking about today. Uh, but I'm going to take this little side trip uh, and talk about what last days mean, because Joel talks about it, and Peter also does in this particular paragraph. So let's start with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, so much uh, for your teachings here and uh, and for the help in uh, understanding your word. Thank you, Lord, so much. We don't realize how much you've given us with the Holy Spirit to be able to explain things and help us to understand things. May you give me the privilege and the honor of uh, representing uh, and speaking about your word in a way that's honoring to you always. And we give you praise and thanks in all that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so picking up here in verse 14. I know we left off in 18 yesterday, but uh, I'm gonna re uh, we're going to start off with Peter uh, when he gets into this idea of Joel. And so I'm just going to uh, first just do a little reflection about uh, this particular period of time. So now we get to see the spirit-filled Peter. I got a little uh, illustration here that I picked up. Uh, this is where we left off with the, uh, with the Holy Spirit coming upon the 12 disciples, 12 apostles, excuse me. And then we're going to move to uh, this particular display. And we've got Peter here. He's going to be talking to the crowd because uh, they've, they've been making some interesting uh, accusations with him. Now we, see, now we get to see the spirit-filled Peter. I'm often amazed, though. As we look at Peter, I think we don't realize the power we get when, when, uh, when the Holy Spirit was given to us. And Peter's a great example. And uh, we know that the Holy Spirit was promised to them and us, uh, starting Jesus himself, starting in John 14. So I'll read a few verses just speaking to that. First, to refresh our memory, of when Jesus promised this to us. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Very important term, forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth not him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. That's an important aspect. And I still, I don't think we understand fully how important it is that the Holy Spirit is indwelling us and helping us to understand uh, God's word. <clears throat> also in John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whether I have said unto you. Also jump into John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So, so we can see this definitely as we move into chapter 2 here. Uh, Peter as an example. As we remember that, uh, I remember back in Matthew, uh, Simon was having a little bit of difficulty uh, uh, even, even remembering that Jesus Christ was, uh, he was follower of Jesus Christ. Remember back in Matthew 26, 69 through 75, the famous denial by, by Peter of Jesus Christ. Let's reflect back. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou was with Jesus of Galilee. 
But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto him that we're there. This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied with an oath. I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him that they stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for they speak betrayeth thee. And then he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. That was the, sing, that was the Simon Peter of just a few weeks ago. Uh, in this particular period of time. Now we're going to see the, the Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. And I just love this example. So let's start off by reading uh, Acts 2, 14 through 17. <clears throat> but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it be the third hour of the day. I guess unlike here, the bars there weren't open that early. Uh, so getting alcohol that early in the morning was not uh, achievable uh, by, by his, what he was saying. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. And it, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. <clears throat> well, first off, I want to take a pass at uh, this term, <clears throat> last days. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Very interesting term right there. And I just want to kind of pick that apart a little bit. Because uh, last days, I think in our common uh, knowledge that uh, we, you know, when we think of last days, we think of something that's fairly close to us. But here they are over 2,000 years ago talking about the last days. So obviously it isn't talking about uh, being something very, very close to their period of time. So what was Peter talking about here? And we're going to kind of take a look at that for a second. A distinction must be observed between the last days when the prediction relates to Israel and the last days when the prediction relates to the church. So that's what we're going to look at here. So look at us in a few verses here in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believeth, which believe and know the truth. That's an interesting verse right there that they're even talking about nowadays. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 8. This, uh, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men of each shall be lovers of their own selves, covetousness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without natural affliction, truth bearers, breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heedy, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Sounds like we're talking about people today. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, for such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead the captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, those are the, uh, the two, uh, this, we actually find out their names here. I always find that interesting. This goes all the way back to Exodus when Moses was uh, putting the snake down. These were the two that put down their snakes and Moses' snake ate their snakes. That's who those are. Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. So did these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds retrobate concerning the faith. Also in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. First Peter 1, 4 and 5. <clears throat> 
speaking of Peter, uh, this is later on when he, reads, when he writes his, uh, his epistles, to an inheritance incorruptible and defiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Second Peter 3, 1 through 9. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. And say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, <coughs> whereby the world that, that, that then was, being overflowed with the water, perished. Talk about the flood. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. God doesn't have a really a relationship with time. Time is just very, uh, it's not It's not something that uh, even thought about really in, in his, his respect. Verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And some more of 1 John. Let's get John in there. Uh, 1 John 2, 18 and 19. Little children, it is the last time, as you have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby you, we know that is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Speaking again. The, of things happening in the last days. And the last one on this particular subject, in Jude, that would be the uh, uh, half-brother of uh, Jesus, one of them, verse 17 through 19. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts, these be they that who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. And this is the Father will, and this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again the last day. Oh, I'm in the John now. Let me go. Let me, this is another this is something else. <clears throat> These being the, who separate themselves central, having not the spirit. So that's the end of Jude there. So also distinguish the oppression, the last days, which is plural, from the last day, which is singular. The last day, the, la the latter expression referring to the resurrection and last judgment. And now here we go into John 6, 39. Quite a few verses in John 6. Let's look through them. Verse 39. And this is the Father which what? Will Father's will which hath sent me, that all of you which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but shall raise it up again at the last day. This is Jesus talking. Verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one who seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me to draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. On all these verses, you notice it's a, it's a single day they're talking about here. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And jump into chapter 11, verse 24. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Even Martha knew it. That was back uh, when he was talking to Jesus about Lazarus had just died. And chapter 12, verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So that's that's the last day, which is talking about the last judgment. We're talking about towards the uh, we're talking about the end. 
just prior to the millennium kingdom. The last days, as related to the church, begin with the advent of Christ. So when Christ came on the scene, it, it actually started the period of the last days. <clears throat> we see this in Hebrews 1, verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. <clears throat> But have a special uh, reference to the time of uh, uh, declination, which means to decline or apostasy. And that this period of time will be noted by its apostasy at the end of the age. Second Timothy three one and verse. Second uh, <clears throat> Timothy three one. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And also in verse four four of Second Timothy. I didn't put that in there. Let me get to back here. Second Timothy four, four. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So the last days is related to Israel are the days of Israel's exaltation and blessing and are synonymous with the kingdom age. This is where we get into Isaiah. Isaiah two, two through four. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. So this is getting into the period of time when the Jesus is up back on the earth. He's establishing his kingdom. And so for the Israelites, this is the, this is the term that, that's used for the last days. And many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and he will walk in our paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords in the plowshares and their spears in the pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So that's speaking about the Millennium Kingdom. And that would be the last days spoken of, of Israel when within the Bible when they talk about last days. So you can see a dispensational change here between the church and Israel. Also in Micah 4, 1 through 7. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountain, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord shall go forth out of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Again, speaking to the time Jesus will be ruling and reigning with us, because we will be there to assist him uh, from Jerusalem during the Millennium Kingdom. Micah 4, verse 3. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords in the plowshares and their spears in the pruning hooks. Sounds just like Isaiah, don't it? Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. For all the people will walk, every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. And I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth, even forever. <clears throat> so they are last, not with reference to the dispensation, but with reference to the whole of Israel's history. So I think that gives you a little bit of idea of the differences between last days. And so uh, we, uh, we are in the last days because they started with Jesus Christ and they end when Jesus Christ takes us home for the church age. But for Israel, they end when, uh, when, the, when, when we move into the millennium kingdom. So I found that a rather interesting uh, side note there. Okay, getting back into uh, Acts again. And, uh, and adding in verse 18, And my servant and my handmaids 
I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Okay, so back to Peter. And we're starting this reference about Joel. Because he talked about Joel. That was in verse 17. Let me just reread that. It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So this is speaking to Joel, and uh, I'm going to cut up this passage in Joel in a couple of phases, because we get the verse 28 and 29 is really speaking to something that was happening during the apostles' time. We're going to look at that first. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Okay, the spirit again is the Holy Spirit. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Okay, the spirit is being poured out to all of us. But I think that that idea of dream dreams can have dual fulfillment. But I want to try to explain the difference between what the apostles were doing when they were, see, the, uh, the New Testament wasn't built yet. They didn't have the uh, beauty of having that to speak from. So they were speaking directly from visions and stuff that they received from God, particularly when we get into Paul's writings. Uh, he actually received a, a lot of uh, direct information from Jesus Christ himself, I believe, in Arabia. And we'll get into that when we get into Acts chapter 9. <clears throat> but during this phase, because the New Testament hasn't been written yet, of course, there was a lot of dreams. There was a lot of prophecies being given to the writers of the New Testament, right up until John uh, last revelation in Revelation, <clears throat> which was about 95 A.D. So this first century period was full of this particular verse, I believe, uh, verse 28. So we, so I believe this is speaking to the period primarily ending in part as the canon of Scripture comes to a close in the first century in John penning of the Revelation, which would fit into the prophecy, but could include our own generation up until the end of the church age as a last resort for, to reach someone with the gospel who does not have access to either the Bible or a true believer. I'll never forget this book I read, and I, and I just looked for it before I started this study to see if I could find the name of the book. problem is there's been a lot of uh, people in places like Iran, Muslim uh, men and women, who have come to the Lord through dreams and visions. So I don't doubt that uh, in places where it's very, very difficult to get missionaries, that uh, the Lord Jesus will appear to people in a dream and draw them to him. So I think it still has some effect today, but also that uh, God expects us to, to receive our, uh, our prophecy can also mean, prophecy can also mean speaking about forth telling. There's foretelling, which is talking about, about telling the future, which we see in the Bible a lot, you know, in the New Testament and the Old Testament. There's also prophecy that's, about, that's called uh, forth telling. And that just means that we're taking the Bible and we're talking about it to others. So now that we have the whole Bible, prophecy is really talking about us presenting the gospel to others. So part of the reason I can't find the book again is when I do a search, yeah, I found so many, uh, so many other people. Uh, but this particular Muslim woman, she didn't identify what country she was from. She grew up in a very heavily Muslim family. Uh, that went to the, uh, that uh, was a devout. And believe it or not, back in, uh, there are periods of time that if you try to be a Christian in the Muslim community, you could be, you could be killed. Uh, that's how serious they take their religion. And so she feared for her life. And it was a really good book. And I wish I could find it. I think I got it from the library. So one of these days I might stop by the library and try to find it again, just so I can tell you about it. Because I was really impressed with her willingness to, to stick to her guns because she was getting these dreams from Jesus Christ that she said herself. And she became a devout Christian over it. So back to, so now to continue on and what, and what, uh, so this is the, this is a picture that was shown about the, the Holy Spirit will come upon uh, uh, the young and old alike. I like some of these pictures. There's P Peter again. Talking about what we've already talked about. 
Now we're going to get into this verse. The sun will turn into darkness. Verse 19 and 20. Now we show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. This comes out of Joel also. This is That was Acts, uh, Peter speaking. And he's speaking about Joel, which is Joel 2.30 and 31. Now it show wonders in heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. But today these verses have not really happened yet, in my opinion. Now you will hear people talking about blood moons and they'll try to put emphasis on things that they're seeing in the heavens. And I don't doubt that uh, these are foreshadowings of the things to come. But I think that most of these things are talking about things that are going to happen during the tribulation leading up to the end uh, of the tribulation period or the, or the time of Jacob's trouble. So I just want to speak to that for a few minutes. It, men it mentions the uh, great and terrible day of the Lord. So let's look at some verses on that. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 1 through 3. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. I think it's kind of hinting there at a period of time uh, known as the uh, midpoint of the tribulation. Uh, it's good. The Antichrist is going to set up a, uh, a peace treaty with Israel. So it's going to seem like it's very peaceful during the first half of the tribulation. And then all of a sudden, sudden destruction is going to come. That's going to be at the midpoint. So that's, I think that's what Paul is referencing to here. Here in Thessalonians, the Thessalonians had thought that this day had already come. And Paul is saying, no, it didn't come yet. Uh, but also go into Isaiah 2, 10 through 22. So this is the main prophecy about this. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of men shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everyone that is proud and lofty, upon everyone that is lifted up and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon, they are high and lifted up and upon all the oaks of Bashan. I love it. Every time I hear that word, I think about that uh, that thing that Jesus talked about on the cross in the Psalms. And upon all the high mountains and upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower and upon every fenced wall, upon all the ships of Tarshish and upon all pleasant pictures. And the loftiness of men shall be bowed down, the haughtiness of men shall be made low. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth. Sounds like Revelation 6. Uh, towards the end of Revelation 6, the uh, seventh she uh, uh, seal. Sixth seal, I mean. For fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake terribly the earth. And topping out time of Jacob's trouble. Isaiah 2.20. In that day a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. Cease ye from men whose breath is, is in his nostrils for wherein he is to be accounted of. Which of course is talking about uh, in this particular part in Isaiah, talking about Revelation 19, 11 through 21. And of course that's the classics uh, we will witness this day. We will be on our own white horses right behind the Lord. And he's going to take care of the battle. Revelation 19, 11 through 21. And I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. 
The armies which were in heaven followed upon him upon white horses clothed in fine linen. See, we're dressed in white. We're not even going to get our hands dirty. White and clean. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I say, an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, flesh of horses and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both far, free and bond, both small and great. I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which were he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that had worshipped his image, they both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which swords proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So, of course, this is mentioned also in Joel 2.31. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Okay, so, the last part of this, was in verse 21 of Acts 2. And, that, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, of course, that means anybody. But what's interesting here is we know that Peter was talking about Joel. And Joel actually adds a little bit to that, uh, that particular verse. And it's in Joel 2.32. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion, that's in Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So I think this, this, this Peter is here actually talking about when Israel will actually respond uh, to the uh, to the call, and they'll call out to the Lord, which of course goes back to Matthew uh, twenty three thirty nine, and also we talked about we talked about this uh, Wednesday even uh, when we talked about a little bit about uh, this particular period of time when uh, when Jesus will finally return to the earth uh, at the end of the tribulation when Israel actually calls out to him and I think that's what Joel is mentioning here so we can see that difference between all believers will do have to receive the Lord have to call in the name of the Lord but for Israel it won't actually happen uh, for the nation of Israel as a whole until the end of the uh, time of Jacob's trouble. So I found that an interesting parallel there. So we will stop there and uh, we will st pick up again next week where we actually talk about Peter uh, delivers a uh, sp his first sermon. We'll kind of take a look at that uh, the rest of this chapter. So I really enjoyed this lesson and I hope you did too. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Oh, Lord, thank you so much for uh, helping me to see uh, the, the the different phases that you have, in, you have planned uh, between uh, this dispensation and, of course, the next one that we'll be moving into. I have a feeling, Lord, that you're, not, you're, you're returning and it's coming very, very soon. Not setting any dates, though. So whenever that is, it's fine. And I'm ready, willing, and able to go whenever, you're, whenever you call. And... Uh, as the old saying goes, Lord, send me. So, Lord, thank you so much for the uh, for everything that you give us each and every day. Help us to be bold in our witness for you. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Okay, so you guys all have a great weekend. And as I always say, that if you're in the Florence area on Sunday, please join us over at Fairhaven Baptist Church. It's on Highway 287 between Coolidge and Florence. And hope to see you there if you're in this area. If not, I hope you have a great Sunday and that uh, you have a great ch church of your own to go to. So have a great weekend and we'll see you next week.